Thank you for listening to the Damage Report podcast, the show covering the true threats facing our country and what you can actually do about them. You can support this free podcast by leaving us a review and giving us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you happen to be listening to it. Every review helps more people discover the show at no cost to you. Hey, how's it going? I'm John Adarola. Good to have you here. Uh, Brooke's here as well. Brooke I'm here. Thomas, Hello. Yeah, journalist. Good morning. And perhaps most importantly, Monday co-host yes. of The Damage Report. Always Monday. glad to have you here. Um, best we've thing got, about Mondays. That's the best thing for my Mondays. <laughs> and you <laughs> come you. in fresh off the weekend, which is nice. We're not all beaten down uh, as we are on like Thursday and Friday. So we've got a lot that we're going to be talking about today. Um, if you're just tuning in now, uh, Les Moonves is out-ish. We're going to be talking about that. And then a little bit later on, um, we've now had a few days since Nike announced that they were going to be working with Colin Kaepernick in an ad campaign. There were great predictions about how much damage they would suffer from this uh, giant social media boycott. We've got the first returns. We know now what financial impact Nike has uh, suffered or gained. We'll be talking about that. And then later on, we're going to be talking about two of the most objectionable people in American politics, Tucker Carlson and Ted Cruz. Uh, we're both just terrible people. We're going to be breaking down some of what they were saying over the weekend. And perhaps most importantly, we're going to be joined by Karen Blair uh, later on in the show. His organization uh, has produced a report in terms of, on funding of our education system. And in particular, how much money the government has not funded low-income students and students with disability and what effect that has had on those students and on those schools. And so we're going to be breaking down all of those details uh, a little bit later on. So very packed show, buckle mm -hmm. up. We're going to be starting off with something just really quick. I noticed this because David K. Johnson, who's a friend of the show, had tweeted out uh, the front page of the Wall Street Journal. So if you could bring up this screenshot, you're going to see, if you're listening, I'll explain. Um, it's uh, the front page, and you're going to see a little chart of uh, wage growth. And the headline that they have is uh, wages continue to push upward. And there's this chart showing the wages over time. And it shows that in the most recent quarter, or uh, sorry, I should say in August, wage growth was 2.9%. And remember, headline, wages continue to push upwards. So, hey, great economic news. Except it's not, because while the wage growth was 2.9%, inflation was 2.95%. Which means, and he did the math, so if it's wrong, I apologize, uh, I, I don't do math. Um, if you make $1,000 a week, you've lost 50 cents. And so to pitch that as a good thing, a slow but steady rise, is a little bit odd for the Wall Street Journal, who I would imagine would have the financial experience and expertise to think about inflation when talking about wage growth. So to not put it definitely seems weird, and it's been a couple of days, and they haven't issued any retraction or an update. So weird. It, it's almost as if they're looking at these numbers from the point of view of someone who doesn't spend a significant portion or all of their wages on things that will be affected by increased inflation. So if you're extremely wealthy, then perhaps this has actually been a good month for right. you. But if you spend every dollar on rent and food and all those sorts of things, transportation and insurance, um, you actually have fallen a half step behind over the course of August 2018. Which, Which is not a good thing. No, not a good thing. to celebrate, right? Yeah, and is it any wonder that the Wall Street Journal is not a widely read, like, it's not like everybody's like, you know what, I'm really curious about my economic situation, so I'm going to read the Wall Street Journal. Wait, this is not the first criticism, though, I've heard recently about the Wall Street Journal. The Wall Street Journal is owned by the same company that owns Fox News. Am I right? I am not sure about that. I know absolutely nothing about the ownership of uh, newspapers, but that does sound right. I, I, Certainly, I'm, they have similar interests, there I would has say. Been, there's been, like, a recent shift into what... The paper covers. Um, and yeah, so perhaps we should not be surprised. And look, under Donald Trump, obviously, there are going to be certain segments of media that want to give you the impression that things are improving. Mm -hmm. And again, for those people, they are improving, but not for regular people who are voting for Donald Trump, who are watching Fox News. They need to be lulled into a false sense of economic security. They can't afford to give them the true news, which is that, right. yes, the economy grew a little bit. But no, for regular people, it had no positive impact. Anyway, uh, let's move on to uh, the big story of the day, and that is uh, Les Moonves, which we were talking about before the show, actually. We were. Yeah, I've been talking about this all weekend, actually. This you is, have. There's a lot of news that has, you know, broken about this all week, and we had... Um, so what do people need to know? Well, there was, there's so much going on. So there's the story, of course, everyone knows about the story that broke initially with, um, I think, six women, mm -hmm. six allegations. First of all, this all... The first... Him being in the news is the battle with the Redstone family. Mm -hmm. That's when, you know, we first started talking 
um, recently about what's going on, and then these sexual misconduct allegations break, and then this is Ronan Farrow's reporting about six women sexual harassment claims from the 2000s. Right, the first one a while ago, and mm-hmm. now this most recent I Ronan Farrow it's, uh, column six with six new women, women, but all names. Yes, and then so there was on a the piece record. in Vanity Fair mm-hmm. about um, a doctor, and then there was a piece in the Huff Post about the treatment of Janet Jackson. Yes. After the Super Bowl incident. Yeah. So there's been a lot going on. And then the breaking story today on every outlet is that he is for sure stepping down. Yes. So CBS chief executive, uh, obviously very well known to people, not uh, me, um, has uh, apparently had a really bad history, a really checkered history that has been at this point now well documented. Mm-hmm. And perhaps the documentation is not done because it appears that in uh, Ronan Farrow's first big piece about this, that apparently, it seems at least, to have generated more women who have come forward. It's possible that over the weekend, this most recent reporting will have the same sort of effect. So we can't be sure at this point that it is just 13 women, just 13 women, air quotes around that. Uh, And by the way, in terms of the the claims, the initial six women, there were reports of um, him attempting to either either hit on them heavily, force himself on them. Um, But the most important part is then coupling that with threats of damage to their career if they don't go along with it. The most recent six women include self-exposure and forced oral sex. You mentioned the doctor. Mm -hmm. There you have him allegedly forcing himself onto a doctor or attempting to. And then um, when she rebuffs him multiple times, uh, him masturbating in front of her. Right. That was the allegation. And then I think someone pointed out that in a in his book, he wrote that those allegations were untrue. Was it in mm-hmm. the book? I'm like, oh, there's so much of this going on. But that he tried to kiss her yes. and he regrets that. But that the masturbation was not true. Did not happen. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe he's right there, but it also fits into a long track record of this sort of behavior. Right. And as we were talking about in the morning, um, maybe he just tried to kiss this doctor that is a very weird thing to do at 6 a.m. or around then. It's a very inappropriate thing to do. It's not, it's like. Regardless, it, yeah. And I think because it gets brushed aside because you have these far more serious allegations. But the idea that you're a doctor trying to do your job and a patient tries to kiss you. Yeah. It's, that's a big deal. Exactly. Um, and in the background of all of this, with him leaving, um, there was initially reports that he could be making something like $100 million, $100 million exit dollar package. Payout. I saw news that. Um, he and CBS were going to jointly donate $20 million. $20 million, um, yes. But you know what? This is not surprising for me. At one point, I remember years ago seeing a piece about him and calling him the highest paid CEO in New York City. Yeah. That's- the head of C- CBS is the highest paid CEO in New York City. This was, I don't know if this it was if it's still current, but it was. He's definitely one of the highest paid media executives. Yeah, absolutely. Regardless of any exit package. Exactly. And so he's got to have some ironclad contract. And I just think you saw a lot of people this weekend upset that he may leave with a bunch of money. But mm-hmm. I don't think there's a workaround. Mm-hmm. I mean, I just we saw it with Roger Ailes as well. As well, I don't think there's a workaround yeah. around. So getting out of, you know. They, they did announce uh, on Sunday right. that his severance package will be dependent on ongoing internal investigations. Okay, well, we'll right. see about that. We'll, we'll find out. Um, but obviously, huge amount of money. And, and in terms of threatening the women with damage to their career, and then we find out with Janet Jackson that he had uh, banned the playing of, of uh, banning her from the Grammys, banned uh, VH1 and MTV and all Viacom owned Viacom own stations to play her music and videos. This is a person who's not just sexually aggressive, obviously, which is enough of a problem by itself, but is then using this in fairly well-documented terms to eliminate women's careers. Mm -hmm. Which, as an example of what the whole, what the Me Too movement was about, this is really every angle of it, all encapsulated in one person. This is a person who has perhaps singularly more power than anyone else in entertainment, at least by certain metrics, who is willing to use that power to threaten to eliminate women's careers, to actually harm women's careers. You can take a look at what happened with Janet Jackson if they don't go along with the things that he wants. And uh, that is what this movement is fighting against. And there are people, including in CBS, who probably still have his back. And he might end up getting dozens of millions of dollars at the very least, even after all of this information comes out and continues to come out. I mean, his wife is arguably one of the faces of the company. We need to talk about a relatively new show called Un the Republic or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media, and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies, debunking the conventional wisdom. In each episode of Un the Republic, 
or UNFTR, the host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated by the so-called powers that be, featuring in-depth research, razor-sharp commentary, and just the right amount of vulgarity the UNFTR podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows. But don't just take my word for it. The New York Times described UNFTR as consistently compelling and educational, aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school. For as the great philosopher Yoda once put it, you must unlearn what you have learned. And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today and get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time. Yeah. As far as on-air talent. And um, you also, it has to be said that these are all allegations, Mm -hmm. very vivid, very clear, but allegations that he has repeatedly denied. Exactly. Well, he he denies them. We do have to acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. We also have to acknowledge this is another guy who has uh, a dozen or more women. Right. At a certain point, it gets a little bit hard. Decades. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Okay, we are going to take uh, our first break, but when we come back, a police officer entered what she says she thought was her apartment and then shot dead the man who actually lived there. We have an update on that terrible story after this. Welcome back to the Damage Report, everybody. We turn now to another instance of a police officer uh, gunning someone down in extremely suspicious circumstances. Uh, This time, it's a Dallas police officer, Amber Geiger, who allegedly entered an apartment that she is saying she believed was her own. And then when she encountered the person who actually lived there, this is uh, Botham Shem uh, John, uh, shot him dead. 26-year-old native, he's in his home. Mm -hmm. Somebody is trying to get in, has trouble getting in, oddly enough, since it's not her apartment, and was apparently in no fit state of mind to understand that she was making a horrible mistake, and it ended with that man uh, being killed. He uh, attended Harding University, a private Christian institution in Arkansas, and he belonged to the Good News Singers in the campus ministry. He was an employee at Pricewaterhouse Coopers, and um, she apparently said that she had a physical confrontation. Uh, This is with a different person, by the way. I want to give you context on this uh, police officer's career. This is back in 2017, um, shot someone after a physical confrontation in which a man allegedly grabbed an officer's, her stun gun. So we're talking about a year and a half in which she had two confrontations like this. Maybe it's just coincidence, maybe not. Um, But he's dead. And uh, we're getting a little bit more information now about what led to this. So uh, Sean King had tweeted out that the cop apparently used a key fob to attempt to enter the apartment. It kept flashing red because, again, it's not her apartment. And then he opened the door and she shot him dead. So I don't know what argument you can make in this case where what she did was anything other than a perfect embodiment of the fear driving these police officers where when they see someone who looks a certain way, their first instinct is, I have to save my own life by murdering this person. But in this particular case, it's again where this guy was in his own place. And very valid questions here. Why do police officers get the benefit of the doubt when they are off duty? This is not the first time we've seen this. It took days for us to get an official confirmation of her name. Mm -hmm. This is not um, an officer-involved shooting on the job which there's questions about why that's legal, why, you know, the officer's name and identification, it's all hidden until the investigation is complete. When they're off duty. When they're on duty. Oh, yeah. Usually, you know, you don't immediately get the name, but this is off duty, so would she not be considered a private citizen? Exactly. She's off duty, and it took days for an actual person to be charged, this Mm. manslaughter charge, this took days after a man was shot and killed. Would that happen with your average private citizen? A regular person who was trying to get into their apartment. Uh, I would assume, see, we give them the benefit of the doubt because of their status in the community, because of their training. I feel like we should have higher standards Mm -hmm. for them. If you have, if the same outcome comes, but it's a cop instead of a regular person, you should have been better equipped to actually avoid that. 
But we go at it from the exact opposite direction. So as you point out, she was actually arrested and then uh, eventually released uh, on $300,000 bail. Um, but again, this fits into a pattern of these situations with this particular police officer. Do we know for sure what that physical confrontation was like uh, in this case? Do we know for sure what the person who grabbed the stun gun, did they actually grab the stun gun the last time? We know that there are police officers who are allowed to get away with a pattern of violence and, and bad behavior, irresponsible behavior. So that man in the incident did plead guilty yes. to trying to grab an officer's weapon. Which could mean that he plea. did it. Right, it, two years in jail, it's, uh, doesn't, I guess it, could, it also could have been, mm-hmm. you know, what we see in, in pleas behind the reasoning behind them for many other reasons. And the You're thing right is, about that. It, I, you know, I think there's a question from a lot of people that I saw online. There is something that makes people uncomfortable about and a government issued weapon being used on personal time. And yes, because let's just say this was just a massive, just freak accident. The fact that an off-duty officer always has the option to grab for their government-issued weapon to use it to defend themselves is bothersome to a lot of people because they're, does that make sense? Of course, yeah. Yeah. And the thing that that especially bothers me, so if we look back a few years to Ferguson Mm -hmm. with Michael Brown, Right. right? So the thing that the argument is always they had to kill the person, um, and then they sketch out the situation for how the physical thing went down. So either a person reaches for their gun, or in the case of Michael Brown, he's he starts a certain distance away from the police officer, and the, the police officer shoots him. And then they want you to believe that this person, in these cases, was so dead set on killing this cop that even though they had a gun pointed at them, even though they've already been shot, they continue attempting to kill the police officer, which is, to my mind, an impossible situation. No one like sees this cop that they don't know and is willing to die just for the chance of getting their hands around the throat of this cop. But that's always how it's described. That this person, even though a gun's being pointed at them, even though they've been shot, even though they might be fatally wounded, all they want in the world is to kill this cop. And then that situation is put out there so that everybody who blindly supports cops says, well, they had to do what they had to do. And also just, we always talk about fear for officers and is that safe? It's not safe. It ends up not being safe for a lot of innocent people in a lot of instances, the officers fear. But in this instance, there's the question of what happened that caused her to be so confused about where she lived. So there's getting off the wrong elevator, getting off the wrong floor on the elevator, you know, walking down a different hallway. And maybe they look the same. Um, Maybe you don't notice, you know, different decorations of floor mats or whatever your neighbors don't have because this is not your floor. Maybe you don't notice the numbers on the wall, on the doors. Maybe you get there and then it still doesn't click when your key is not working. And when someone else opens the door, and I imagine you get a quick glimpse into an apartment that is not yours, what caused that? Was she too tired? Mm -hmm. Had she been drinking? We don't have these answers yet because police are waiting until they finish their investigation before they give us really much of anything um, as far as a statement. But it makes you think, you know, this is at the end of her shift. If she was just exhausted and there was no alcohol involved, we have regulations in place so that surgeons aren't holding scalpels. Yeah, when they are pilots too can't tired. fly if they haven't slept enough. Right, and so if you're in that space right as you're shifting, what happened an hour before? Were you okay? Could were you, you have been okay? Is it safe? Were you good to work? Right. Yeah, yeah, and also, and again, what we have to we have to imagine that based on what she said, she accidentally tries to get in there, and then what actually happens that precipitates the shooting? What they are saying to us is that this person who somebody comes to their door tries to get in. He opens the door, sees a woman there, Mm -hmm. and then attacks the woman. That's a nonsensical situation. That did not happen. Nobody believes that that actually happened. But that is what we are told to believe to justify the fact that she shot this person. Okay, I want to just quickly transition to our next story, um, which is, oddly enough, uh, a protest movement against exactly this sort of situation. So uh, Nike announced last week that they're going to be working with uh, Colin Kaepernick on an ad campaign. Those ads have started to come out. And the right-wing reaction to Nike's move and to Colin Kaepernick, as it has been to this entire protest movement, was both extremely predictable and, yes, it turned out exactly what we thought it would be. And so you had people saying um, that they're, Nike's turning against the cops, they're turning against the flag, the anthem, police officers, apple pie, bald eagles, whatever. And uh, you had things like Donald Trump tweeting, what was Nike thinking? 
Yeah, what were they thinking in working with this extremely inspirational athlete that many young people uh, look up to for obvious reasons? Um, and predicting that they would suffer massively as a result of this social justice warrioring. Well, we now know that Nike's online sales went up 31% from the Sunday before Labor Day through the next Tuesday. Um, now, they had grown in 2017, but they were almost double the growth this last time. So if it was your thesis that they were going to suffer massively because of the right-wing boycott where they're, they're cutting out their Nike symbols and they're burning their shoes, uh, the evidence does not seem to be um, uh, on your side. Uh, are you surprised by this? No, not at all. And we talked about this last week. This is exactly what I said. This is not as much of a civil rights statement as it is a financial statement. This is a mm. business decision. And I think logic here said and told us when this announced was made that Nike had already crunched the numbers. Yeah. They had completely accounted for all the people that this was going to upset. And they knew that, that this they was were still going to be big money. And I think what this has exposed, and the piece that you sent us last night, um, that this has exposed the lack of diversity when it comes to analysts who monitor and predict what's going to happen to the stock market. Yeah. Because logic said, oh, Nike's going to be good, maybe great. Yeah, because and you know the, the sort of people that buy them and the sort of people that don't buy them. Right, and Nike knows their markets, and uh, the stock market analyst said, no, this is going to be bad. Yeah. And why? And by the way, you're going to have another spike in sales when all those, uh, the, the few younger, uh, J- the J-holes, um, who burn their shoes, in a couple of months are going to forget about this, and they're going to buy more Nikes, and they're going to need them because they burned their other pair. Right. So uh, expect some, some trickling effects from this uh, further on. Um, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, though, there have there has been some lashback against Nike that isn't necessarily hurting them financially, but it is making clear what some parts of the country uh, think about uh, both Nike, Colin Kaepernick, these sorts of uh, social protest movements, and we're going to be breaking those down after this. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Uh, we're talking about uh, Colin Kaepernick, Nike, and the right-wing protests against them. Right-wingers would have you believe that the reason they're frustrated with Nike is because they're getting involved in politics, taking okay. a stand like this. They just don't want them to be involved. But that's not actually true. And the reason I believe that is uh, others have now gotten involved on the opposite side. So multiple places are now banning Nikes because they have the audacity to work with Colin Kaepernick, amongst many other uh, athletes. So th- first we have the uh, mayor of Kenner. You're going to see a memorandum saying that in Kenner recreational facilities, uh, Nikes and their products are now banned. So you're not allowed to uh, spend the funds there for booster from booster clubs and things like that on any of their apparel, shoes, athletic equipment, and or athletic uh, products. So there, they appear to be making clear where they stand on this political issue. Uh, the mayor, by the way, has been reached for comment uh, and has not given any comment about this. So very bold stance there in banning it and refusing to actually explain why you're doing that. Which essentially says that the mayor of this town in Louisiana is so angered at the idea of a protest against police brutality mm-hmm. and racism that this would be their necessary outcome. Because there have been a lot of talk about how Nike is jumping into politics, but Nike is not jumping into politics because the reason Colin Kaepernick was kneeling has nothing to do with politics. Mm -hmm. So you can't, just because other people have tried and effectively changed the narrative doesn't mean that we don't have to just stick to the facts. It has nothing to do with politics. Nike isn't jumping into politics. They're supporting an athlete's right, his First Amendment right, and they are supporting, and unintentionally maybe, the fight against police brutality, the fight against racism, and there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, it's an inspirational it's athlete. It's nothing to do with the anthem, nothing to do, right, it's like, I don't know. That's what Nike does, is it works with <laughs> right. athletes like Colin Kaepernick. Um, well, now the city of Kenner is uh, is on the record. Uh, they are against this now, so right. they're jumping into politics. We'll see if there's a boycott of the city of Kenner. Right. I have a feeling that probably, no one's going to burn the city of Kenner, and please don't. Um, no one's going to be cutting out the city of Kenner from the surrounding area. Um, but it's not just the city of Kenner. Also, uh, Michael McHale, president of the National Association of Police Organizations, said... We were offended by the fact that Nike chose to use Mr. Kaepernick as their example, and we made it known not only to Nike, but to the members we represent, approximately 241,000 nationwide. Yes, we are urging a boycott. So there, this uh, organization of uh, police organizations is uh, jumping into politics 
and making clear that they are opposed to Nike and to Colin Kaepernick's movement. So I expect a right-wing boycott of this police organization's organization, right? which will not be coming. And every, whenever you uh, try to break this down with someone and you explain what the boycott, you know, I mean, what the protest is about, and you say, okay, so you see, do you understand? It always comes back to, well, he wore those pig cop socks. Mm -hmm. And I don't know where I have been all my life that I did not realize that, um, calling, I thought, I guess I understand how it's offensive, but calling an officer a pig is some sort of now mm -hmm. racial slur yeah. against. Well, I don't think it's a racial slur. It's not. I, I do support like, the viral video, Animals Are Innocent, saying we shouldn't use animals <laughs> just, as slurs. But that's really about defending ridiculous. the animals, <laughs> not the people. They're really focused on the animals there. Um, and then finally, uh, by the way, uh, we also have uh, La Plata, Maryland, Mayor Janine James, who posted on the personal Facebook page, Nike selected Colin Kaepernick as the new face of the company's Just Do It campaign. How disappointing. Hashtag boycott Nike. So uh, multiple towns are just rushing to make clear to people where they stand on this issue and probably some related issues as well. There we can speculate a little bit about, we know why people are opposing this. We broke it down last week um, with Francis Maxwell. Um, this fits into a long, generally dark history mm -hmm. of uh, opposition to African American social movements and um, also lying about what they actually stand for. Right. Again, simply saying that they're boycotting the anthem, again, or that they're protesting the anthem, we know that that's not what they're doing. They've been very clear about that. The inability of these people to be intellectually honest about that shows that they're probably not being honest about why they oppose this in the first place. So let's jump to the next one. Okay. Ah, Tucker Carlson. Oh. Here's a shot from Tucker Carlson's show on Friday. How exactly is diversity our strength um, we're not going to play the video for you because that's literally his facial expression in every frame of the video. He's not capable of making another face. But I love this screenshot because for me, it is conservatism in 2018. It used to be on Fox News that they would run fairly exclusively stories about African Americans that are negative, stories about white conservatives that are talking about how they're victims and it's positive. But that was too subtle in the past. Now, you have to literally do segments saying diversity is bad. Right. And then get really indignant when people point out that that's what you're doing. By the way, this isn't the first time Tucker Carlson has literally had a segment about why diversity is bad. Back in January of uh, this year, Fox News uploaded a video titled, Tucker, Diversity Isn't Our Strength. That's what he stands for. That's what Fox News is right now. So he asked a couple of questions in his video that I would like us to respond to. Okay. He said, and I apologize it's long, but don't worry, I'm not going to have his voice actually reading it. I'll read it for him. How precisely is diversity our strength? Since you've made this our new national motto, nobody's done that. Um, please be specific as you explain it. Can you think, for example, of other institutions such as, I don't know, marriage or military units in which the less people have in common, the more cohesive they are? By the way, I love when someone writes into a script, I don't know. Like he's like thinking of it, That's he read it off a teleprompter, but whatever. Do you get along better with your neighbors or your coworkers if you can't understand each other or share no common values? Please be honest as you answer this question. So this the condescending confusion is so frustrating, I think, for a lot of viewers. But also, that question right there, do you get along better with your neighbors if you can't understand each other or have no common values? And the answer to that is no, which is why diversity is necessary, mm -hmm. so that people aren't confused, so that people do understand each other. You can't just, like, he. I think he's coming at this from the wrong way. So yes, maybe the, it's well, right, <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> but but even in his questions, I think he thinks he's saying one thing in it to try to be like you know kind of cute and con you know just like oh, I'm anti diversity, but it mm. actually just answers why diversity is, is necessary. so important. And maybe if he were around different people growing up, he wouldn't be so nasty. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think, but no, you don't. Which is why we see so many mistakes. Which is why. Police officers are a lot, not all police officers, but some police officers and have admitted to being spooked or scared by big black men. They're by, told to be scared of them. Absolutely. Why, um, look at our criminal justice system. Like, yeah, absolutely. You don't, which is why you need diversity. We need to understand that we're all the same, that our differences yeah. don't really mean much.
Yeah. Yeah, that's why diversity is important. He is definitely coming at it from the wrong. Right, right. Where, where are we talking more about him? Because I think that he is really the media embodiment of the new push for white supremacy in mm -hmm. American politics. And he's been very clear that that is what he wants. He, his audience, he sees it out there, the alt-right, the white supremacists, the new American Nazis and things like that. They need someone in media who has their back, and he has been that. Laura Ingram is trying to compete with him, but he's really been more reliable. Um, he says at the end of that question, please be honest as you answer this question. So I will be honest. You're a racist moron. That's all you are. You used to have this reputation as being like the smart conservative. You either never deserve that or you traded it for a large salary. So you've got that now. And you also have the stink of being a racist moron. And by the way, what an intellectual surrender. Do you get along better if you can't understand each other or share no common values? How little did you think about that? Right. That because there's some demographic difference between you and another person, you can't understand each other and should probably not try. We'll just give up on the entire thing nationally and share no common values. I've got news for you. A person can be black or gay or not abled or older or a different religion, and you can still share a lot of common values. I have a feeling that if I wandered around the world, I would find that while those people might have different cultures and might look different, might listen to different music or eat different food, we probably share a lot of the same values of empathy and curiosity, rationality. You and I don't actually share those, even though we're the same pasty shade of white. <laughs> we have a lot demographically identical, you and I, Tucker Carlson. But in terms of our values, pretty much nothing is shared. And thank God, because your values are absolutely awful. They're custom designed to appeal to the worst aspects of American society in 2018. And you're being well paid for that. But hopefully not for long. Your audience is dying off every single day. Perhaps if Fox News had a little bit of diversity in thought, if not in demographics, there would be one person who's not a 70 plus year old white conservative Christian who actually watched Fox News. And that is why Fox News might be doing well now in this last gasp of American white supremacy. But its future is dark indeed and probably not that long off. Anyway, that is all the time we have in this segment. We'll be talking more about Tucker Carlson. In the future, when we come back from this break, though, Karen Blair is going to join us uh, of uh, Reclaim Our Schools that did an amazing analysis of education funding in America, where it's going, and more importantly, where it's not going. We'll be breaking that down after this. If it wasn't already obvious that our nation has long uh, failed, our students, and in particular, low-income students. We've now got the numbers to back it up. And uh, we're lucky on the Damage Report to now be uh, joined by Karan Blair of the Alliance to Reclaim Our Schools, who just uh, concluded a report in terms of funding uh, for education in this country. Karan, welcome to the show. Thank you. Good to be here. It's great to have you here. So uh, you have released your report uh, confronting the education debt we owe billions to low-income black and brown students and their schools. Uh, so in this analysis of education funding, what did your organization find? So I think you've said it right. We found that between 2005 and 2017, Congress um, has underfunded uh, public schools uh, that serve primarily black and brown children and children with disabilities by $580 billion. And that is not, I'm not overstating that. That is the number, $580 billion that did not go into the schools and communities of Title I schools and IDEA schools. So when you hear a number like $580 billion, my first reaction is if you had asked me the total amount of funding that has gone to schools in that time, I would not have guessed $580 billion. So how, how did we come to a point where it was possible that this funding was supposed to go to these schools but has not gone to those schools? Is that an oversight? So is that a choice? So it's, it's not an oversight. It is it, For us, it is a matter of choices and priorities, right? Because in that same amount of time, the, the wealth of the 400 wealthiest people in this country grew by about $1.2 trillion. And so what we've seen is a choices made to under-resource our schools while giving tax cuts to those who are the wealthiest in this country. And, and for us, that is the fundamental problem here. So I saw that the Young Turks has a write-up of this report, and they talk about one thing. There was a law, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, passed under President Johnson that was supposed to address inequality and in funding for education. But as they point out, as you do in your report, in even the first year of that bill, they underfunded the program. So how has it been able to go for decade after decade now with nobody actually funding what the law is supposed to require? Yeah. 
So, I mean, I think that's a critical question, and it, it has been the question that education advocates around the country have been wrestling with and organizing around. Again, we come back to this idea that, you know, when it comes to serving black and brown kids in this country, those communities have never been a priority. And so while there have been attempts on the, the part of educators and parents and students to organize to get this, this, these resources, we have never actually built the kind of political power necessary to garner those resources. And so for us, you know, even, even now around the country, there are a number of campaigns where people are demanding deeper and more deliberate investment in our public schools. And, and so we're continuing that fight, but Congress has not responded to the kind of pressure that we've been putting on Congress. So I also want to mention in your report, you talk about the, uh, the funding for students with disabilities. Can you talk a little bit about your findings in that area? Right, similarly, right? So while the, the funding for Title I um, has been seriously under-resourced, IDEA was a mandate. And similar to what you're seeing since the very first year of, of this mandate, we have not seen the levels of funding that's been required. And what's happened is that states and school districts are then having to take necessary resources out of their public coffers in order to fund IDEA, because that is an actual requirement. And so all across the board, we find that students are suffering because money Right, limited resources are being diverted from one program to the other in order to fulfill the IDEA mandate. And our proposal is that instead of shifting resources from schools and communities, that we should fully fund Title I, we should fully fund IDEA, we should tax the wealthiest people people in this country and corporations and make sure that they pay their fair share and then move those resources into our public schools. You know, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I, I'm curious, uh, are there any politicians that, that you think have the back of, of people who are pushing for this sort of writing of this, this long-term wrong? You know, that's a good question, right? And so on, on Wednesday, we will stand together as educators and parents and students with Congressman Bobby Scott to call for this kind of investment, right? And Scott and, and his colleagues have in the past attempted to, to move bills that would guarantee or demand some of this funding. But again, the sort of bipartisan support that is needed to, to move these measures have not been existent. Primarily because, again, in this country, we continue to, 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 to push the needs of children of color and children with disabilities to, to, to second and third level priorities. And, and what we're saying is that if we are to move forward, then we have to prioritize the needs of our black and brown kids and kids with disabilities. Well, hopefully more people will take up that battle because it's hard to imagine a better potential return on investment than funding education for these communities after being. Absolutely. Now, I said absolutely. And again, you know, we've been doing this kind of work for a very long time and we know that it is not accidental. Right. We know that this is about race. We know that this is about whether or not and, and the degree to which we care deeply about black, brown kids and those uh, students who have disabilities. And we're saying that moving forward in the same way Congress, you know, moved resources to rebuild Europe. We're saying that we must see the same kind of investment in our public schools and in our public infrastructure. I like that analogy to the Marshall Plan. I think that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> well, uh, Karan Blair, uh, co-director of the Alliance to Reclaim Our Schools, thank you for uh, the work of your organization. Thank you so much for the time. And if folks want more information, visit our website, educationdebt.reclaimourschools.org. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, uh, Serena Williams, the uproar about her reaction <laughs> during a recent match and some of the right-wing reaction to what she said and did after this. Welcome back, everyone. Just minutes remaining, and we are now joined for, I believe, the first time ever on The Damage Report by Rick Strom of TYD Sports. That's right. That's right. That's what I represent right here. Hello, everyone. This is my last appearance as well. How are you, John? Well, after you, that, I guarantee it. So um, I've been on the internet and the internet seems to want me to be right, mad George at Bush. Serena Williams. Right. Why is that? Um, well, it's, I mean, that's a heavy question. Um, the long and short is she was penalized for something that literally every single athlete has done in the sport of tennis. And she was penalized because she received improper coaching. Newsflash to everyone who's maybe watching this show and hasn't watched tennis. 
Everyone does it. It's like breathing air at this mm-hmm. point. So she received improper coaching, received a violation. Excuse me. On top of that, she then uh, got into a dispute with the chair umpire after she smashed her, ratch- uh, her, her racket, was given uh, a point deduction, and then after arguing, calling the chair umpire a thief, was given an entire game. So wow. Naomi Osaki, who, by the way, deserves all the credit in the world as a 20-year-old, beating her idol, Serena Williams. This That's is who amazing. she grew up uh, envying and just wanting to be. She beat her, but it's somewhat tarnished at this point. Because she went up from, I believe it was uh, 4-3 to 5-3, and then she just needed one more game. So give credit where credit is due, but what occurred was flat-out awful, in my opinion. So I have a follow-up question, because uh, I don't play a lot of sports, but one sport that I did play a lot growing up was tennis. And so I am concerned about the future of tennis. (laughs) Now that, for the first time, there's a high-profile tennis player who mm. smashes rackets. Mm. Because that never happens. What is going to happen with <laughs> tennis? <laughs> we got to build more sustainable rackets, obviously. <laughs> obviously, the, the racket should occur. bounce. That's I think. arguably the only penalty that maybe she possibly deserved. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, yeah. I mean, she, you could say that. It was the only one. I mean, but listen, first you do have the penalties, the sexism, and then the fines that happened afterwards. But then we wake up this morning, all of us, with this just undeniably racist depiction of the greatest athlete in the world. Do you want um, an example of that? Do you have it? Why don't we bring up this cartoon from Mark Knight, editorial cartoonist for the Herald Sun in Melbourne. Uh, I mean, come on. And it's racist. There's, There's Not only do you have this, but what you don't see is him depicting a black and Japanese woman I was just as a say, white yeah, woman in the background. Odd. It's that not very- odd. It's just <laughs> racist. Um, and by the way, just in case oh it's not clear God. where this guy Mark Knight is coming from, if we could bring up this next one. This is another cartoon that he had done showing a politician with an uh, entirely black-faced anonymous mob smashing things. Mm-hmm. Um, so just to give you an idea where this person is coming from. Um, and then also, Seems we're not like going to show the videos, but um, Fox News, it's all been, uh, she's a, a bad example for right. women. She's emotional. It's hysteria. Mm-hmm. It's a mm-hmm. meltdown. Right. Athletes get pissed off. And I was joking before, but obviously even inside of tennis, some of the best-known tennis players ever, what they're known for is smashing rackets and screaming and stuff. Not only that, what we remember, whenever you hear the name John McEnroe, you think of (laughs) one thing, right? (laughs) Yelling at chair umpires. He goes, how can you see that? Along with many other words that we can't say on the show. And yet it seems like a lot of the times he wasn't penalized. There was one time with the Australian Open. That was literally it. He maybe got a point here and there. Uh, I remember seeing in 2009 when Roger Federer took on Juan Martin Del Potro, who Del Potro lost in the final, the U.S. Open. Not, or he won in 2009, lost on Sunday to Novak Djokovic. But in that match, Roger Federer, cool as a cucumber all the time, swore at the referee multiple times. You know what happened to him? Nothing. Right. So there's a clear double standard here. It's super unfortunate. But what I did like was that an American tennis player like James Blake, who we remember for beat, or for taking on Andre Agassi in the U.S. Open, came out on Twitter and said, I've said way worse. Yeah. Right. Andy Roddick came out, and real quick, Andy Roddick came out and also said, who got into vicious, vicious war of words with chair umpires and said that was the worst officiating he's ever seen. Yeah. This is also not the first time that we've had this example of why black people just have to be perfect. Mm-hmm. At all times. You can't ever be frustrated as an athlete. We saw the same conversation happen after Cam Newton quietly got up and walked out after he lost the Super Bowl. Great point. The biggest game of his career. And this started a conversation online about how black women are treated in the workplace. Mm-hmm. And immediately, if you even if you're right, you have to know everywhere to be timid about your responses, to keep quiet, to it's not take people. credit, to not scare people. Because if you speak up for yourself, you are immediately given the angry black woman trope, which is what we're seeing, which is what we saw in that cartoon, which is what happened on Fox News yeah. in their conversation about her and about her behavior and her emotions, that coded language that she's angry. She's not. She's kind, mm-hmm. and incredibly kind, because she's a woman who works her tail off and an incredibly accomplished woman who t- set aside her own feelings and emotions because she knew that she was the only one in that entire space who could stop those booze. Right. She knew that. So she set aside her own emotions totally. so that Osaka, her, her, this moment wouldn't be ruined because the umpire did what he could to ruin this yeah. moment forever. Her first Grand Slam will be totally. marred with totally. 
this. It's remembered for this. Forever, absolutely. Yeah. Real quick, even to piggyback off of Brooke's point, let's be real about this. Yeah. Tennis has been like an all-white sport for the longest time. And now that we're seeing black excellence, especially from a black woman who has been incredible, arguably the greatest athlete we've ever seen, yeah. I think there's that been some, some blowback people. on that. And by the way, this same chair umpire penalized only Venus Williams for the same exact thing years yeah. ago. So Thank you for you know, that controversy. Uh, we do have to go, unfortunately. Uh, thank you, Rick, for joining us. First time, Rick Strom. No YG problem. Sports. And my last. You Appreciate it. it. <laughs> yeah. Great to have you here, Brooke. <laughs> As you. always, Great thank you for here. watching, everyone. If you're not already subscribed to the podcast, please do so and rate it. And we'll see you tomorrow with much, much more. Thank you for listening to the Damage Report podcast, the show covering the true threats facing our country and what you can actually do about them. You can support this free podcast by leaving us a review and giving us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you happen to be listening to it. Every review helps more people discover the show at no cost to you. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.